So near the end of Edouard Manet's life, he produced this painting, the bar at the Folies Bergère, and he debuted it at the Paris Salon of 1882. Most people agree he knew this would be his last great painting, as he was terminally ill when he painted it. The image takes place in a music hall slash cabaret that opened a little more than a decade earlier in Paris. The place was described by contemporaries as a place of unmixed joy. And isn't this just a joyful painting? It's not. It's, it's not that happy of a painting. Sometimes I feel like I need to clarify my tone if I intend irony because as is often commented on, I have a monotone voice. The central figure of the painting, who was an authentic barmaid named Suzanne, and Manet asked her to model for this, has a memorable stare that nobody could call joyful. It seems like everybody who sees this painting sees something different in that stare. Some people say that she's bored. Others see a daydream. Some see her expression as having joy actively draining from her body. Others say that she shows no emotion at all. And this, in a place of unmixed joy, with a trapeze artist in the corner and crowds of people coming together with all the energy of an affluent urban community. But if you spend more than a second looking at this painting, that stare is certainly not the most striking part of the painting. The most striking part of this work is the mirror behind the barmaid. It clearly runs parallel to the bar, perfectly straight, yet the reflection is askew. None of the objects in the mirror accurately reflect the bar and the barmaid in the foreground. As the art historian Kermit Champa once said, the bar looks right before it looks wrong, and the latter sensation never completely subverts the former. So today we're going to look into that mirror. Since the nature of this mirror is one of the most widely discussed features of any painting in the Western art historical canon, Let's go through some possible interpretations together. So let's start with that countertop. It's a pretty standard still life. Oranges in a vase, flowers in a cup, beverages on either side of the small marble counter, pretty unremarkable stuff on the surface, but these unremarkable items become transformed in the mirror. They are shifted to the side like everything else, sure, but also, they are not truly reflected. In the reflection, they appear close to the edge farthest from the barmaid, but in the foreground, they appear on the edge closest to the barmaid. Additionally, there's a man in a top hat who, if we messed with the perspective of this painting, we would realize should be standing in front of us as we view the painting. He's very close to her in that reflection, and our vantage point as the viewer is simply not that close. He doesn't exist in the foreground, but does exist in the reflection. My point, I guess, is that the world is clearly transformed in the mirror. Maybe it's a daydream. I mean, the whole space is a fantasy. The bar shown here is a place where people go to view themselves as exciting consumers of luxury and urban life. They see a show. They drink a fancy drink. They see and they are seen. So maybe the mirror, the reflection or representation of reality, is an acknowledgement of that idea within this space. That one goes to this bar in order to see themselves as kind of fancy. Or we can take this fantasy or daydream idea in a different direction and look at this more specifically as the barmaid's fantasy. Maybe we can see this barmaid's physical reality behind the bar and then, in the mirror, we see the reflection of her inner world. Like, perhaps it's a memory she had of talking to the Top Hat Man. Maybe it's a fantasy of that Top Hat Man who, it seems, is also in the crowd of people staring directly at her. Like, imagine they have eye contact, then she imagines a conversation between them, which is then reflected to the viewer through the mirror. Certainly, if we choose to pursue this line of inquiry, we would get some interesting Freudian interpretations about our unconscious and all that. But we don't need to. We could make it bigger than that. More than just the psychology of inner worlds, maybe it's about the relationship of those inner worlds to the art world and the philosophy and theory of art generally. Perhaps the mirror shows us how the representation of reality is necessarily a distortion of reality and is a meditation on the role of art in society. In a similar way to Velázquez's painting Las Meninas, which has within it the ideal world, the reflected world, and the real world, a concept explained well in a TEDx animation, 
this painting has an idealized version of the world with perfect oranges, flowers at the height of their beauty, and bottles of champagne that seemingly don't even need to be kept cold. It also has a reflected world askew and distorted, something different and more playful than the idealized or the real. And by this painting's nature, its physical reality in a gallery or at the salon, it also shows us reality, us, the viewers, who do not see ourselves in the mirror, nor can we imagine a space between the bar and the ledge for us to exist in. In this way, the real exists only to be negated by the idealized and the represented. I mean, that's a really interesting path to go down if we wanted to. It would certainly give us a whole lot to talk about regarding the role of art, but we don't need to do that. We can instead choose to look at this painting and this mirror as a meditation on the loneliness that modernity and urbanization bring to the individual. The population of Paris boomed during the 19th century. In 1801, Paris had just over half a million people. By the time Manet painted this, the population was approaching 3 million. That kind of rapid urbanization and the impact that that would have on the individuals experiencing it is something that just kind of needs to be processed through art. And here, Manet is showing us how, in a sea of people, we can actually feel more lonely. She's by herself, inside her own head, inside that pensive stare, even as the unmixed joy swirls around her. Physically, she is among others, but mentally she is alone. The mirror shows us this, and it gives us a lot to think about if we decide to pursue that path. But we don't need to. We could instead look at this painting and the mirror within it as phrasing questions about tradition and modernity. In that case, we can look at the foreground as a traditional still life, a portrait of a barmaid, a perfect stillness. The items in that still life show us tremendous skill, traditional skill, a glass vase, a glass cup, illustrated convincingly. That's not easy, but it is what one would learn how to do at art school. And then, in the mirror, we have modern life, movement, commerce, spectacle. It's dynamic. It has an acrobat, globs of paint that give the impression of movement, dynamism, and life in a moment. Modernism, Impressionism. The mirror, in this case, perhaps shows the world as though we are approaching the barmaid and then turning to walk past her and looking over our shoulder as we do. We see her at first straight on and then from the side as she helps another customer, the top hat now. In this way, we are seeing multiple perspectives across multiple times. We see the barmaid when we are in front of her and then we see her again as we are past her thus showing the speed of modernity, showing the multiple perspectives of a crowd, basically doing a whole bunch of the stuff that modernists do. But this multiple perspective at multiple times thing, if that's really what this image is doing, would mean that Manet was playing a cubist game decades before the cubists. And that wouldn't be the first time that Manet was ahead of the curve. If we look at the painting this way, then the whole thing is a comment on the tension between tradition and modernity foreground and reflection, and this is a theme Manet liked to play with. This line of reasoning would certainly give us a lot to talk about if we decided to continue down that path. But we don't need to, or at least we could take a turn off that path and discuss how Manet liked to quote from other works of art. Famously, he quoted from Titian when he painted Olympia, or how he quoted the creation of Adam in his Luncheon on the Grass. In the bar at the Follies Bergere, I like to think he's quoting from Mary Cassatt when he painted this lady in the background. Some art historians, like Michael Paul Driscoll, discuss how Manet might be quoting from a popular representation of Mary when he painted Suzanne. He brings up images like this one by Jean Hippolyte Flandrin, who was also quoting from others. Notice the position of the hands and how they resemble the way Suzanne stands in Manet's painting. This standing position evokes the Virgin Mary, standing, arms at her side, palms out. But then, in the reflection, we see Suzanne talking with a male client, and this in a place where the barmaids were known to sometimes engage in casual prostitution on the side. This sets us up for a conversation surrounding the virgin and whore dichotomy. Suzanne, in that case, exists within the full range of that societal construction of woman either being the pure or corrupt, 
and the desire evoked by both of those constructions is present in Suzanne. In the foreground, she is a virgin. In the reflection, she is a prostitute. I'm sure if we decide to pursue that line of thought and think about that a little more, we would certainly run into some really interesting feminist theory. But we don't need to. Or again, we could just take a turn at the religious iconographical elements of that path and follow that line of reasoning a bit further. Pope Gregory the Great, way back in the 6th century, formulated a distinction between what he called imagines and historia painting. Imagines were paintings meant to evoke an emotional or devotional response, while a historia paintings were meant to tell a story. As Driscoll puts it, one represents the thing to be worshipped, and the other explains why. We could view Manet's painting as doing both of those things at the same time. We have the icon of the barmaid, evoking that Madonna imagery in the foreground. And then, in the reflection, we have a historia element of her doing her job. This would then be the experience of an everyday woman venerated for her familiar and everyday work. She is to be admired in the foreground, and the reason why is explained in the reflection. Pursuing this line of reasoning would certainly give us a lot to talk about if we decided to continue down that path, but we don't need to. We could instead think about how this painting frames questions about commodification in the modern world. Those still lives on the counter are not fully traditional still lives for the simple fact that they are on public display for purchase. It's like a still life as an advertisement. Then we see the result of that advertisement in the reflection as a customer approaches the counter for those objects and tries to buy them. It's interesting that the items for sale actually move toward the customer in the reflection, for example. Among those bottles for display are two bottles of Bass Ale, which has the distinction of being the earliest known trademarked product. That distinctive red triangle marks it as Bass Ale. With the rise of modernity came the rise of trademarked products that became valuable because of their label. Manet plays with this idea in a couple of ways in this painting. For example, he uses that distinctive red triangle on Bass Ale, but he also uses it on the barmaid's chest perhaps referencing her inclusion among the items that are for sale. He also plays with this idea of commodification on this bottle, on the far left of the painting, which includes Manet's signature, alluding to the fact that his name is something of a trademark. This painting is a commodity itself, along with literally everything else in the image, and so there is this underlying idea that the brand exists as a veneer laid on top of some authentic product and gives it value, a surface construction that adds constructed value to some consumer product. So there is the advertisement in the foreground and the impact of this marketing in the reflection. This painting would certainly give us a lot to talk about if we view it through the lens of modernization and commodity exchange. We would get into some fun Marxist theory, I'm sure. But we don't need to. And that's what I find so amazing about this painting. It seems to prefigure any argument about it. Whatever ideological lens you want to apply will be fruitful when you look at this painting. It will stretch in order to give you a platform to discuss all sorts of ideas. There are interpretive frameworks like that of Pope Gregory the Great from the 6th century demonstrated in this painting, but there are also post-structuralist frameworks from the late 20th century demonstrated in this painting. I'm sure there will be frameworks constructed in the next century that will also find an interesting platform to discuss ideas inside Manet's mirror. That's a masterpiece. I can even see this thought within the painting. Viewers stood in front of the barmaid in 1882 at the Paris Salon, bringing with them all of their interpretive frameworks, and then they stepped aside, and looking over their shoulder, they could see the future to stand before her in their absence. In 2020, we also stand before her with our interpretive strategies, and soon we'll walk past and look over our shoulder and see the new art theorists looking at her as well. I hope you like this video. There are sources in the description below in case you do want to pursue any of those paths a little further. Thank you for watching.